مرحبا بكم جميعا وحياكم الله في هذه الورشة التفاعلية سعداء جدا بمشاركتكم في برنامجنا التدريبي الذي ننظمه في هيئة أبوظبي للطفولة المبكرة بالتعاون مع شركانا نسعى في هيئة أبوظبي للطفولة المبكرة إلى دعم مسيرة التنمية الشاملة للأطفال وتعزيز رفاهيتهم منذ فترة الحمل وحتى سن الثامنة وضمان نموهم في بيئة داعمة وآمنة وتعزز وصولهم لموارد وأدوات إبداعية ومبتكرة وحصولهم على خدمات متكاملة وذات جودة عالية تساهم في تطوير مهاراتهم وتحسين قدراتهم لذلك نحن حريصين على تمكين شركانا وتعزيز قدراتهم لدعم التنمية الشاملة للطفل هذا البرنامج تم تصميمه خصيصا للعاملين في قطاع التعليم المبكر والحضانات بهدف إثراء خبراتكم تنمية مهاراتكم في مجالات الطفولة المبكرة وصولا لتحسين جودة التعليم وتحقيق رفاهية أحبتنا الأطفال من خلال التركيز على أربعة مجالات رئيسية هي الصحة والتغذية، حماية الطفل، الدعم الأسري إلى جانب الرعاية والتعليم المبكرين نتمنى لكم مشاركة ممتعة ومفيدة ومداخلات ترية وقيمة ونتطلع للالتقاء بكم مجددا في برامجنا المستقبلية نشكركم مرة أخرى على حضوركم ومشاركتكم ونثمن لكم جهودكم في تنمية ورعاية أحبتنا الأطفال Hello and welcome everyone to today's session. Today we'll be covering learning through play with our beloved Agatha. Hi Agatha. Hello everyone. Um, before we start, I would like to thank the ECA, um, Abu Dhabi Early Child Authority, Minister of Education, ADIC and Charge Education Council for making this possible. Um, Another note before we kick off today was the delay in the certificate. So we obtained the approval on Wednesday from the licensing authorities on the certificates and we started dispatching them on Thursday. So hopefully, fingers crossed that we'd finish the first three weeks um, attendees getting certified this week and then the rest for next week. I am sorry for the delay, but the licensing authorities have to approve before we send anything out. And now we can start with today's session. I get the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. So I'd like to welcome everyone to today and thank you for taking some time out of your Saturday to join me. Um, so we're gonna do things slightly different today. My cue point is to ask Rafi to go to the next slide, which I'm going to do now. Please, Rafi, if we can move forward. Awesome. So today's session is going to be all about play and how important play is. So who am I? Um, I'm Agata Maturi. I've been working here in the UAE for over now 19 years, and I am passionate to inspire others. And this is what I do with my staff. I have to be honest, it's my first time of doing it to a bigger crowd, um, so bear with me. What I'd like you to keep in mind is that today is only 45 minutes to an hour long. Um, and that is not much time to talk about the importance of play. So as much as I'm gonna give you information and hopefully inspire you, you're going to have to walk away and go and search other things to do and how you're gonna put it all together. So um, I'm gonna give you a little snippet of, um, of what play is all about. So let's begin. Rafi, if you can go to the next. Awesome. So what are the subjects we're going to cover today? We're going to cover the true value of play. What is play and why is play critical? How the environment supports children's creativity and imaginative play. Process of a product. Um, if these are familiar to you, that's great. If it's not, don't worry about it. We're going to cover it all in today's session. Introduce the value of role of loose parts. Some of you might have heard of that before the observation of play in children, ideas for introducing creative play in your setting, provocations and invitations, which I'm sure you've heard about, but again, we're gonna cover that today. Great, next slide, please. So let me just get onto my slide on my side. Excellent, so what does learning through play mean? Well, I literally typed it into Google and this is what it came up with. Learning through play, is a term used in education to describe how a child can learn to make sense of the world around them. Through play, children can develop social and cognitive skills, mature emotionally, and gain 
and gain the self-confidence required to engage in new experiences and environments. So in a nutshell, it's basically a child's career. That's what they need to do. Play is their work. Play is what they need to do to be able to open up all those development levels. Next. So we're going to start off with something that a lot of you probably know already, which is provocations and invitations. I don't particularly like the word provocation. I haven't found another word to replace it yet. So if you guys have ideas, I would love for you to share at the end. Um, this is um, a term used in Reggio Emilia's work. Uh, and for those that are not um, aware of her work, please look her up. Um, it's a particular pedagogy. Um, and um, it is a very good pedagogy that you can get a lot of inspiration from. So these two terms are very close. Um, but they are different and um, and they do get muddled up because there's just a fine line between a provocation and an invitation because nurseries in Dubai mainly cater to four and under practically all of the activities we put together overlap between provocation and invitations so please bear with me while I try to do my best to explain the two so a provocation can come in many different forms this is always intended to provoke thought ideas and actions that can help to expand on the thought project idea of the interest of the child. Provocations allow and encourage children to experiment the world for themselves through open-ended activities without being overly guided by a teacher or another adult, for example, a parent while they're playing. So the idea behind provocations is to encourage children to think independently by encouraging their interests and the explorations of those interests. So what children are interested in, just let them explore it further. One of the most crucial aspects of a provocation is that there is no wrong outcome of the provocation. So there is no, you need to let the child just get on with it and whatever result comes about it, that's where it's gone. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? That's really, really, really important. Next. So invitation to play, this is a big, big one. So invitation to play encourages children to learn through exploration by providing materials that invite them into your play or into the setting of where you want them to play. It is a creative and non-directive way of getting children to play, okay? Each invitation is lovingly handmade. So a lot of things in, in these things, and I have to, it's, it's practically, you can't just buy them. It's not you go to a shop and go, oh, I'm gonna buy this inspiring piece. These are bits that are either found in nature, either they're found in, they're generally found completely outside of toy stores, okay? So they are handmade, they're using generally natural materials, very carefully sourced, um, recycled, repurposed materials, basically anything that's gonna be pretty wow. Um, and going to make children think about what they're playing with. The emphasis is on beauty and sensory pleasure to encourage and inspire creative play in young children. You know, you give them a car, you can only go so far. Give them some bits of odd bits to put together and all of a sudden there's a whole other world that creates itself. So for children to enrich their vocabulary and discover new things, they have to be introduced to new things all the time. And Although children have an idea of what they like, they only know what they like if they've actually experienced it. So the more you expose them, the more they're going to have a repertoire of things that they truly enjoy playing with um, and to take it to the next level. And they might not like it today, or they might not enjoy it as much, or they might not engage as much. But if you keep giving it again and again and again, Guess what, as they get older, either maybe a few days, a few months, a few years, then they will go back and play. So saying that we should also be able to explore these new things again and again, and this is what I was talking about. As you know, children need to be exposed again and again to new tastes, new textures, situations, before they are really integrated and have an opinion that they can form about that. You can't just taste something once and go, oh, you know, that's my favorite. Um, generally, most children will taste something and go, mm, I didn't like that. Well, that's okay. You reintroduce it again and again and again and again until they actually can form a proper opinion 
uh, about something. And that's really, really important too. And I'll explain about that, taking the time. So just because the first invitation to play wasn't successful, I don't know, you've created something and there's been a sensory thing going on that the children didn't particularly like, whether it was through sand or through a foam, um, that doesn't mean it, it was a failure. It just means that you know that your children didn't particularly enjoy that aspect of it. So find something else and maybe after a few days or after a few weeks, reintroduce it differently. Maybe add some loose parts, um, which is a term that I will also discuss a little bit later. Um, or it might be putting in their favorite you know, animal inside, get them to explore it, maybe change the container. Um, but don't just disregard it and put it aside. Invitations have to be done again and again and again. And actually um, by a child not enjoying something will give you a lot of food for thought about how you could present it again next time. So adults to introduce children to new anything, huh? by the way, if you're introducing objects, tastes, textures, you can't expect it just to be great the first time around just because you enjoy doing it. So regarding provocations and invitations, this is really what nursery is all about. It's providing platforms and situations for children to explore, um, to be able to get to know the world around them. Children who learn through play, the surrounding adults need to give them space and time. So in all of this, either you play beside them, um, but not necessarily with them, okay? Because generally as adults, we overtake that play. You need to give children the space. They might not want you to actually even be in their bucket. Get another bucket, do something beside them, like another child would, by the way, um, and then give them, you know, even during the day, a time to be able to go back just because we play with it for 10 minutes and then we move on doesn't mean that we can't come back to it and that's really important keeping things out and available for children so that's invitation to play next so i was mentioning in the slide before about time and space to explore this is so fundamentally important you can have the most amazing experiences if you do not give children time to absorb it, go through the motions, play around with it, maybe walk away, come back, doesn't matter how great your experience was, they're not gonna get it. So for children to learn through play, the surrounding adults have to give them time and space, like I mentioned before, to discover and explore. Um, what, on the side, there is a picture here. So this is actually a picture taken in our nursery school where I work at. Um, and one of the things you'll notice, one, you can't see adults. <laughs> they are on the periphery of the play. Uh, what you can see is a lot of things going on. So you've got a child stirring in a pot. You've got the other child that's on the block behind them. You've got children who are actually in a mud tray at the back. And they are all in sync with each other. Some are playing beside each other. Some of them are playing together. Now, if they were only allowed to play 15, 20 minutes, guess what? They're not gonna really do much. Um, so giving children time and space is really, really important. In a play area like this, we spend minimum an hour, minimum. And teachers are allowed to extend that time um, because if they're fully engaged, you don't wanna stop that going on because you're gonna have lots of things, vocabulary, confidence going on there. Um, it's by breaking that connection, it's you, you've just stopped a whole lot of learning happening. Next. So the importance of observation when children are playing, and this is from an adult point of view, children instinctively are, if they're given that space and time, can play uh, from a young age. Um, if parents have involved themselves too much, then actually you will get two, three, four-year-olds who actually don't know how to play and will expect you to lead that play for them because they've never done it on their own before. They've never been allowed. They've never had the time and space to be able to do that. So really the, the question here is knowing when is the time to engage or to step back as the adult whether you're the parent or you're the teacher. So supporting children's development is always a balancing act. 
And as teachers, you know that, you know, do I put too little, too much? Do I intervene at this particular time? Do I step back? And you're constantly doing this dance in your classrooms and even at home as a mum. How much structure, how much freedom, when to step in, when to step back, when to show, give guidance, when to tell, when to ask, when to listen to your children. So the key challenge is not how to teach creativity to children, but rather how to create a fertile environment in which their creativity will take root, grow and flourish. And that is very different. So we don't teach creativity. You actually need to give them that space and time to develop that creativity. And that takes time. This is a whole other topic on its own, by the way, guys, I could talk about this for hours. So I'm just giving you a little snippet um, to get those little cogs working and just look at your activities differently. So like any, any skill, it takes time, research, practice and knowledge. And there's always room to improve, including myself. I am constantly looking for you know, articles, talks, people who inspire me to remind me about the basics. Um, and sometimes we get a little bit too close and we need to take a little bit of a step back to realize that we can change things and make things better. Next. So here there was a little video, uh, which we don't have. So I'm gonna describe it to you. And this was a video that I took within the nursery school. I personally did this video. So this slide is all about when documenting documentating a child interrupts a child's play. And this was about, I don't know, 15 years ago, um, I did this video and it's basically, you see it, I was in the playroom with one of our teachers and all of a sudden I see this little girl at the end of the playroom, so we were indoors, looking into a mirror, completely engrossed with herself, singing um, quietly, but you could see her lips moving and she was in full view in this mirror and really enjoying, she had a baby in her, in her arm. And she's got, and I was like, oh, I need to document this. Straight away, pulled our iPod out, started filming. And then all of a sudden within two minutes into the video, this child now can, has made eye contact with me from within the mirror. So she can see me through the mirror and she's, and I'm standing meters away and she makes eye contact with me. And all of a sudden she just stops and very slowly puts the baby down and starts walking away from the mirror. And my heart just sank. Here I was getting something incredible on video for her parents to see. And I completely ruined that moment for her. She had, well, she stopped playing. And so this is where I want to talk about there is this need as um, either your nurseries or yourself have this need to document everything. And a very easy way of doing that is taking a pen and paper, um, taking a video, um, but actually what are we doing? When we take that pen and paper, we're actually removing ourselves from those children. Um, when we're taking a video, we're actually, again, removing ourselves. And in this particular case, most children don't like to be videoed. And I ruined that for her. It took her another 10 to 15 minutes before she went round the playroom, didn't play, just observing me. I had to really make an effort to get back into a conversation, play with other children. And then she slowly made her way back in front of the mirror, picked up the baby, watched me a few times in her peripheral vision before she started playing again. And that was a really big moment for me to realize that actually we, who are we documenting for? We know our children. I could have just explained that to the mum, and that would have just been enough. I didn't have to have video proof of showing her what her child was doing. So what I, I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure because it, it's such a profound thing that to not make documenting take over your teaching. Documentating doesn't prove that you're an amazing teacher. Documentating your children doesn't mean that you're better or worse. It really doesn't. You really need to pay attention and make sure that if you, and you need to document, don't get me wrong, you do need to, but we really need to be mindful about how we're doing it, when we're doing it, and if it's stepping onto children's play, then like what happened to me, 
never will do that again. So again, just a little bit of food for thought. Maybe this happened to you, maybe it hasn't yet. Um, maybe it'll give you an eye, maybe you haven't noticed. Um, but really it's, it's a big, big thing. So just be mindful about that. Next. So the power of creative environments. This is a big one, guys, okay? Supports create children's creativity and imagination. So before I even go there, um, something that's come up, which I didn't put into the slideshow, but I've been really researching is as a teacher, you don't need the Play-Doh. You don't need the paint. You don't need all those extra things. You as a person should be engaging enough and interesting enough to keep children engaged. All the extra bits that come around, loose parts, environments, all of that is bonus. So one of the things that I really talk to myself all the time is to make them think if you step back and I stripped away everything, are you hiding behind activities as a teacher? Are they the ones shining for you? Or are you actually using your environment to the best of its ability to get the most for your children and not as a stage for you to practice your teaching on? And that's a big one. So I mean, I actually want to do a workshop all about that. So um, yeah, watch this space. So a good early childhood environment meets a child's basic uh, needs and supports and encourages children to engage in activities and implement the program's curriculum. Yes, we all agree on that. We have environments. Now, how about we have environments that could inspire more? So further, the environment is designed to enable educators to facilitate the optimum learning for their children. I don't know if you can see this picture right here, um, but if you'll notice, there is a lot of handmade things. Apart from the domes that the children are on, Practically everything else in that picture is recycled, upcycled, and um, even the domes that they're on can be used as open-ended play. So we can jump on them, we can go in them, we can rock them, we can become a turtle, we can become a car. We can swing in them, so there's motor um, development going on there, there's spatial awareness going on there. In this particular case, they were playing hopscotch in a different way. So open-ended play is really, really important. Next, and Rafi, if we can have the video that comes up, please. So I'm gonna share with you a video. It's not very long, um, but it's very profound. And I will share his name at the end in the notes. And I really strongly advise you to research this uh, gentleman if you haven't done so already. He is an incredible speaker. Oh, no, no, not yes, the other one. The one um, that's a video for afterwards that we will see, who's also a great gentleman, uh, which was on Risky Play. And what you're going to see is only a snippet of, I think, a two hour interview that he made. Um, but it really touched me. And it's something I show my teachers every year um, to remind them. Yes, this one. Thank you, Rafi. Kids are sources of chaos and disorder. Get over that fact. Uh, I was in Central Park and it had rained a little earlier so there were puddles in some of the walkways. I saw a woman walking with her kid. The kid has galoshes on and a raincoat on and there's this big juicy muddy puddle right there. I said, please let the kid jump in the puddle. You know the kid wants to jump in the puddle. The kid is like three or four. And what does the mother do? Pulls the kid around to prevent that from happening. That was a bit of curiosity in that moment that was extinguished. Gone. Kids are sources of chaos and disorder. Get over that fact. And where does the disorder come from? It's because they are experimenting with their environment. Everything is new to them. Everything. You splash the water, there's mud, it's fun. You get to see the cause and effect of a force downward force operating on a fluid you don't have kids with the intent of retaining a clean house these are non-commensurate goals people ask about raising their kids they ask about education 
So I can just tell you that what has to change with our kids, curiosity provided it does not kill them. If it meant we had extra work, I would do that extra work. And on the other side of that is school should, as a minimum, preserve that curiosity for you. When you come down the steps on the last day of school, you should be sad that school is over, not happy, saying, gee, I got to go two or three months without learning anything. And the fact that you're happy that school is over means something is not working in there. You're not enjoying the learning process. If Einstein were here and we're talking with Einstein, we, we could talk to him for hours and hours and hours. You know what question will never come out of our mouths? Is what college did you go to? <laughs> I want to go to that same college. I bet most of your people who've sat in this chair, it's not about what college they went to. It's about their own initiative, their own ambitions, their own curiosity. That is not taught in school, sadly. School, they view you as this empty vessel that they pour information in, you test it over here, you get a high grade, you're praised. Is that who become the shakers and movers of the world? I don't think so. So I can just tell you that what has to change, your task is less to instill curiosity in your kids than it is to make sure you don't squash what's already there. They'll retain that curiosity through the turbulent middle school years into high school. And what is a, an adult scientist but a kid who's never lost the curiosity? How cool was that video? And again, just a snippet of his interview. Um, and he has many, many inspiring videos. I mean, it's just watching that again. I never get tired of it. It's just pretty incredible. Um, and like I said, if you don't know him, um, I will share his information at the end um, and share it as, with as many people as you can, share it with your parents for them to realize, you know, when children are born, we're not given a manual of how to, how to, how to do things. Um, and as educators, it's your responsibility to guide parents, to show them the right way. You know, there's so many wrong ways of doing it um, and so little right ways because we've just been educated that way. And we need to, we are responsible to make that change um, for our children. And although we are very lucky to be in Dubai and a lot of families are very you know, um, privileged to send their children to private nurseries. Um, how about we actually make sure that when they're in nursery, that's what they get day in and day out. There was the most profound thing that I, uh, I heard over the summer. And it was to say, imagine that every day is your, is that child's first and last day in nursery. And if it's their first and last day, what do you want them to walk away with? You want them to be, do, do, think about it what do you want them to take away at that at the end of the day and that really changes things when we get into that mundane routine and we're going oh well, you know I'm going to do this again for the third time or I've planned it this way this week and that's what I'm going to stick to to that particular child is that working for them does it work for you know does it work for most of your children okay it works for most of your children does it work for everyone we constantly, again, that balancing act of making sure that you are catering for every single child in your classroom. I mean, at the moment, our bubbles are very, very small. You know, we're looking at eight and 10. That's not many. And if, you, if you're going to get it right, get it right now. So that when you go back up to your normal numbers, whatever numbers those are, you are going to be catering to all those children, all their needs, all their curiosity, all their interests. Next. So here we have, I can't see what the title is. Actually, there is no title, it's a picture. So my, my screen and Rafi's screen are slightly different. So again, so we have a picture here, no adults. Where the adults on I get, I think you're frozen. Are you still with us? Thank 
sure and explore. Okay, we're back up. Great. Technology is amazing and we are so lucky to have it in. Um, I'm just going to just change my screen size. Beautiful. So it's again, and I'm doing a lot of repeating because guess what? By repeating, we learn again and again and again and again. So in, and so I've written here, you'll notice that these toddlers have no need for adult interference. Yeah, they don't need you at that particular moment when they're playing. Now you might be bored, but that's your job. <laughs> it's not theirs. They don't need to be concerned with what you're doing, but if you're bored and you don't know what you're doing with yourself, then you need to ask yourself the question, what are you doing? And I take a pause there because a lot of us think that to keep our jobs or to be good teachers, we need to prove where our worth is. Well, how about just sometimes knowing that observing your children and watching them is your job. That just because you're not, you know, and it's not standing, it's sitting on the floor in that space because at the end of the day, you are a security for these children. These children are not left on their own to play on their own. This is not what this is about. This is about parents, adults and teachers stepping away and just being there, attentive if anything goes wrong, you know, you never know, the block might fall and hit the child on the shoulder, or on the cheek, okay? But we're not there to stop the play. You know, apart from if it's a risk to their health. But let, let, let's be honest, children can fall, they get back up, they have a scraped knee, it's okay. And it's taking that moment that it's okay to observe, to move around, to play yourself, obviously still watching the children, but it's okay. And I wrote something down again about what, what the gentleman said before about who are our shakers and movers of the world? Teachers are shakers and movers of the world. Well, they should be anyway. So yeah, keep that food for thought. Next. So here we've got another video. So taking what I was saying earlier um, about letting children play, um, is comes right into the topic of risky play or what we like to call adventurous play. Because the moment you put risky, there's massive alarm bells that go off the parents, but adventurous play. And this gentleman says it just the way it needs to be. So I will let him use his words to, um, if you don't already do it, to convince you that this is the way it needs to go. So let's see when that comes up. Um, and you'll notice that these are gentlemen I choose I chose, there are lots of women out there who are amazing speakers, but I chose men because there are some brilliant men out there who are part of the early, um, the early childhood um, education. So let's... So when it comes to risk, we've got to be exposed to risk. The more risk a child is exposed to and can manage, the more the child learns to take care of themselves. So just imagine, especially in those early years where we do have a tendency to hold that toddler close or that young child close. These are the framing and the most important years um, where a child has to be exposed to risk. We're trying to teach them everything they're going to apply to the world. So as a quick overview, the reason why we want a child to manage risk is it means accomplishment. When they seek a challenge and they tackle it and they're not interrupted by a parent pre predominantly, it means they can achieve that task or not even the task, just achieve that goal. Like for example, um, if a child was to come up to this log I'm sitting on, some child with their physical competency, all they'll want to do is get up to this bottom run and that will be fulfilling to them. Other children will be like, well, I want to climb up on here and I want to run on it and I want to jump on it. And it's whatever that child is physically 
capable of is what they'll sway towards. So we've got an amazing inbuilt safety system and children have it. Um, if we're not feeling physically competent or we don't have the physical capacity, our brain won't give us the cue to explore it. The only time where that is overridden is when we dictate that play. We tell them to go climb here and get over that. So if a child's doing it independently, it means they're physically capable. So let that give you confidence. So again, this was quite a long interview that's given us a little snippet, but what do you say? If a child can physically do it, why are we stopping them? They will not go further than their physical capacity unless mom or teacher pulls out their hand and takes their hand. And then all of a sudden, they're not actually using what, like he was saying, what their brain is telling them to do that this is how far I can go. I'm now going to go further and then guess what they've gone further than what they're capable of doing and that's when they get stuck and that's when they rely on the adults around them to give them that confidence to go on things whilst if we didn't interrupt them so if you think and this is earlier guys this is when they're really small crawling rolling over this is what it's all about you're not making them roll over on glass okay you're creating a safe environment for them to roll over Will their little arm get stuck sometimes? Will their little head get bumped on the floor? Yes, but that's part of their development, okay? When they're crawling, children love stairs, okay? Now, we, as adults, what do we do? We put uh, a gate at the top and generally at the bottom of the stairs because children are, find it very, very easy to go up the stairs, yeah? They crawl, they crawl, they go, and they get to a certain height. And as parents, we think it's really cool. So we might get them to crawl all the way up. But what we don't do is we teach them how to get back down. And that's a lot harder to actually reverse the crawl. So then what happens is we just stop them from crawling up the stairs altogether. But we've missed a massive, massive opportunity of learning there. Now, I'm not saying that you don't put gates. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you don't, uh, you shouldn't know where your child is. Absolutely. There must always be an adult with that child. But what if instead of stopping them, we actually taught them something new? I know that when my son was little, we had a massive staircase and he went up three, four steps and he didn't go any higher and he sat on the step and he waited. And I could have just intervened, told him, let's get right back down. Um, but we waited and he got a little bit uncomfortable and he's like, hmm and he went to go slightly higher, wasn't comfortable to go any higher. And again, all I did was observe. So if anything happened, I was there. And about three, four minutes in, he then finally figured out on his own how to get back down. Now, if he was trying to wiggle his way back down, for example, you can either go, there's different ways of doing it, but some ways are, are safer than others. Then that's when the adult can then intervene and go, well, actually, here, how about you do it this way? And that's really the only time that the adult should be intervening in that. Because then after that, my son could go up and down those stairs, no problem. I still had gates. Okay. But then we also implemented rules. And he knew that he wasn't allowed to go up the stairs if I wasn't there. Okay. And that's discipline, which is a whole other topic of its own. Next so we're now coming on to what a lot of people perceive as play as artwork and um, this is a very hot topic in our nursery school because um, we pull away that frame of what um, and it really comes down to this process over product what's the difference well here have a look at the pictures it's pretty simple to see where the sun what has that child done let's be honest guys you've done the cutting around you've done the circle cutting you probably even done i mean that child even the black bits of those eyes has not been done by that child neither has the smile the only thing that child probably did was if we're lucky they had a glue stick in their hand they got a bit of glue and then Maybe if they were lucky, they got the piece of paper and they got to stick it down on their own, but I doubt it because it's really centered inside that sun. So what did that child experience? Holding a glue stick. Wow. That's 
that's really not what we're about. This is not what we do. This is what, not what we go into teaching for. Now, let's look at the other picture. I know it's been condensed into a little circle, but actually this child, um, what you don't see is that he's actually making a circle with his nail. What is he experiencing? Texture. He has full access. There is no time limit on this piece of artwork. And what if it rips? Yeah, because the paper's really soggy. You know, it's all, it's all wet with paint. Does it matter? No. Just get another piece of paper out. Put some more paint on it. Because is this to prove to parents what your child, what, what you're doing with their children every day? Oh, look, look, this is what we made today. This is evidence of what you are paying for to come to this nursery. Is it? As an educated parent, I'd be like, my child's done nothing of that. And I wouldn't be impressed. Yeah. So it's experiencing. So it's the process of the final product. Next, please. I'm going to show you some more examples. So children's artwork. So we need to ask ourselves these questions. And, um, and these are things you need to be asking yourself. If you're a manager out there, ask your staff, put it into a poster. Um, but it's a really good way to reevaluate what we're doing. So we need to ask ourselves, who is this artwork for? Is it to impress parents? Is it for our children? Who is it for? What, is the, what, are, what do we want our children to get out of this? What are the learning opportunities for the child when I do this or when I present this, when I bring in this provocation? What are we, you know, are we stuck in a tradition of creating crafts for the sake of just creating them? And some parents, they ask for this, huh? And that's where as educators, we need to educate them and say, actually, this is not what it's about. And that's tough when you've got a parent who thinks that, you know, the sun that's all cut up is, you know, that, 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 that's, you know, my child doing something amazing. It's not. And we need to break down those walls. Do you need to educate your team and parents about stopping product-based activities? I know we did. And it takes a while and you need to, because a lot of teachers have either been in nurseries um, who have done product over process and we have to unwind that and it takes time. But it's absolutely doable and that's what we do day in and day out. We don't do artwork at our nursery school or very little of it anyway, because it's the experience, not the end product. So before I just, I literally, I, taken away their whole ability of doing artwork to force them to go into experiencing give children experiences and now we are now reintroducing that they can do an end product if they've asked themselves all those questions what is the child getting out of it so do you need to get off the conveyor belt of the process because that's what we do, huh? we get into the, oh, well, we did a camel today and then we did a toucan tomorrow and then, you know, we've got a topic and this is what I need to be doing. Let's get out of that now because your children are not getting the best of you with that. And can you make a change? Can you? Can you make a change just in your bubble? your manager can you make a change and a ripple effect within your nursery school of course you can that's what we're here for huh? because we change all the time and we have to next so product and for those who know this is it's reinforcing what you already know and for those who are experiencing this for the first time i hope that this is inspiring you so what is a product so the educator has already created a sample that we're going to follow. Template. Get rid of them. Get rid of templates. You don't need templates. <laughs> templates are so, they box in creativity. Now I can see there's, there's just a glitch in just the writing. It's the question mark replaces the F. So with a finished product in mind, that's a product. Educator fixes mistakes or repositions item. Let's say you're doing faces. Oh, no, no, the eye doesn't go down here, honey. It goes up here and you move things around. Whoa, 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 what are we doing here? That, that's, not, that's not what we're doing. We don't start moving around children's 
our idea of a face as an adult is very different from a child's perspective. It's not wrong. Guess what? You don't have five and six and seven year olds not knowing where their eyes are. Okay, so you, you really need to think about not stopping them and correcting their work. As an adult, there's nothing worse than having someone go, actually, you didn't do that right. Let's just move that around. You need to learn from your mistakes. And is it a mistake to put the eye down here when you're one? Not really, guys. That's, you know, that's not what it is at all about. And actually, is that the appropriate activity that you should be doing with a one-year-old or a two-year-old or a three-year-old? All artwork looks the same when completed. Isn't it amazing? You walk in and there's 15 dinosaurs all the same. How boring is that? You clearly know that children haven't done any of it. Yeah? So if this is what you have in your classroom, start thinking, how do I change it? Make little steps. Give them different paint to paint their dinosaur in. Give them choices, not too many. How about maybe they tear some paper instead of having pre-cut you know, triangles to make the scales on the dinosaur. Think about how you can break it down. Or how about you just don't make the dinosaur at all and do an activity where you've got dinosaurs and they can play with them. They could even paint the plastic dinosaurs potentially. They're gonna get so much more out of that than doing that 2D artwork. Set resources are given to the child to use. There's that's it, that's what you're using, that's how you're doing your artwork. Yeah, there's this, I'm sure this is happening to many, and this used to happen at my nursery too, huh? Okay, until we made a change. The whole class creates the same item. Again, they all look the same. The schedule is planned, we have to get them completed now. This is what we do, tick list done, dinosaurs are done for today. What if a child doesn't want to do it? What if a child is not ready to do it at that time? Do you do it for them? Do you give them another chance during the day or maybe the next day? Yeah, these are all questions you need to start asking yourself. Pre-cut circle shapes for the child to position. Oh, they're greater. You spend more time cutting them out than the child actually using them. And that's something else. If it takes you longer to prepare something than the child actually playing with it, then there's something very wrong with what you're doing. Think about it again. This is not an activity for adults. This is an activity for children. It's an experience. What are they getting out of it? Handprints, footprints, and cut out by adults. Okay, there is a mixed feeling about this one. Handprints are lovely. They're a wonderful souvenir. But let's be honest, that child does not have, there is nothing for the child in that, okay? It's not like you're letting that child put their own hand in the paint and then you're putting it down. Let's be honest, what are you doing? You take the hand, you hold it, you paint it to get just the right amount of paint, and then you position, don't move, don't move, don't move, and then you push it down, and then you get that perfect print. What did the child get out of it? Zero. So hand prints and footprints, as much as parents love them, maybe do that one if you want to for the first one, and then let them go well. Take that piece of paper away, give them another piece of paper, or no paper at all. How about just putting some plastic down? Why does there have to be evidence of what they've done? And then let them just tap it as many times as you want. And guess what? There'll be no prints left, correct? You'll just have a big blob of paint. But that child got more out of that experience than the one of just getting that perfect little handprint for mum and dad for Mother's Day or for Valentine's Day. You know, it's a very adult perception. It's the conveyor belt of children to complete and take part. Okay, next, come, Eleanor, it's your turn now. Boop, 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 boop. You put it all over. Okay, Mark, it's your turn now. What are they getting out of it? Ask yourself those questions. So product versus, next please, Rafi. Process. So what is process? Process is there is no sample for the child to follow. There's no step-by-step -step direction. So we're going to start by gluing the eye, then we're going to glue this, then we're, no, no, no. There are no fixed results. There's no template. There's no right or wrong way to complete the task. The artwork is unique to the child, following their own unique learning style through their thoughts and ideas. The experience is based on individual choice. You can still give them things to pick from, but give them a choice. 
How about instead of you calling them, they're wanting to come and do it themselves. How cool is that? The artwork is unique to the individual child. The experience is the focus, not the result. Calm, unhurried and unrushed environment. It's tough, I know, because a lot of us are on a strict schedule and that's probably the biggest thing for teachers or, or managers to change because a schedule means I know what that teacher is doing in that amount of time. Um, we need to start breaking that. Child-led activities, what are the children interested in? Entirely the child's own artwork. So they're all different because no two children are the same. Children can make their own choices. Does it even have to be an artwork? Like I said, it's an experience. When you're using blocks, yeah, you can take a photo once it's finished, but there's no, there's no actually, you know, paper going home, this is what we made today. Be spontaneous, experience the pleasure of self-expression. Enjoy the freedom of interpretation. That's what process art is all about. And it's so much more fun, isn't it? When you, as an adult, when you want to have all of that instead of the slime. Sorry guys, I think we're um, experiencing the same issue. I'm trying to get, uh, I get connected again. Just be patient with us, please. Welcome okay. back. Yes, thank you so sorry. Again, technology is great to a point. Um, so let's get cracking. And here we have, okay. So can you make a change? Yes, you can. Of course you can make a change. Allow your youngest children to have the freedom to create their own creations and artwork. In an unhurried world, give them the time and space. Okay. And just let them get on with it. Really, it, it is so liberating. Allow our children this time to follow their own learning styles. How cool would that be that we actually let children dictate how they need to get us to interact with them? To think for themselves, they don't have to, you know, there's that horrible thing about a child going, oh, you know, let's draw a forest. And the first thing the child goes, well, can you show me how to draw a tree? You know, that's when you know things have not gone well before. To create, create artwork, which is, oh, Rafi, could you go to the next slide? Sorry, I've just noticed we're still on the first one. There you go, next one. There we go, so you can make a change. So this picture is a very small snippet. Basically, we, we let the children just paint with leaves and there was um, dried petals and they had, and it's just this massive gigantic piece of paper and they were on that for a good 45 minutes. And again, some children played for five minutes, walked away, came back. Others did a full 45 minutes. Every child is different. And it was quite extraordinary to see them interacting. Children who at first didn't want to touch with their fingers. Others wanted to brush. So we gave them lots of different ways to interact 
and have this experience. Stop pushing them into a box. Yeah, this is what it's all about. And to conform to the product that's all exactly the same. So going back to that dinosaur template, that's not what we're about. Allow our children the opportunities to express themselves without direction or comment or judgment. Who are we to judge? <laughs> we have, this is not what our role is. Our role is to guide, not judge. Our children are researchers in their own learning and not empty vessels to be led with, with our own perception of our ideas and our adult thinking. And that's a really hard thing to do as a mum, as a dad, as a teacher. So let's teach our children through their heart, mind, and body. And let's have a look at some examples. Rafi, next please. So here, product versus um, process versus product. So in the picture there, you see there's a little head. What you don't see, it's actually a template of a child's face, which is empty. And then you would, you know, you'd say, oh, can you draw the eyes, the nose? Oh, I just want to kill myself when I see that. There is no creativity there versus same goal. We're drawing, you know, we're going to do people. We have over here, we've got a template, which is round. Oh, you know, they have a limitation. We gave them loads of bits, so loose parts. And we said, make a funny face. And that's what the children are doing with sticks, locks, pieces of string. And this kept them busy for so much longer. Plus the fact that these children really shouldn't really have a pencil in their hand yet because they're still exploring all the muscles in their fingers and in their forearm that's attached to their arm. And it's still, they still had to make, so it took them time. They can see what their friends are doing. Oh, that's how you're making that. So process over product. Now, the teacher could take a picture and that could be shared with parents, but there's no actual piece of paper going home. And let's be honest, the one on the left, would you keep that? Nah, you wouldn't. You just go straight in the bin as a parent. The one on the right though, that picture, that has so much more meaning. Next, please, let's see some more examples. Process versus product. Here we've got a kitchen on one hand, everything is dictated in how it needs to be, the burgers, this is how it is, this is what's inside, this is what we're doing. There's a signage, can children read yet? No. This is, again, it's a very adult world. Toys were made by adults, not by children. Versus, oh, there we go, cooking also. There's mud, leaves in there, full access, we're turning. You know, they get to choose how much water, how much mud goes in, what happens if it spills? Yeah, this is what childhood is all about. Next. Again, we made a spider. Clearly that was not made by a child, okay? Or a much older child. Versus, this was before COVID where our children didn't have to do social distancing. Um, and these children are FS1 and their exercise, they have all the little bits of color that you see. Our legs have been cut off, but they made a giant spider as a group. And the evidence was this picture. But what she also did, she had the camera in a corner and she did a fast track camera showing how the children actually figured out because that's also interesting. Did they start with the body? Did they start doing the legs first? And the children figured it out and that took them a good 25 minutes to do. Who led? Who was following? Who was listening? And as teachers, this teacher got a lot out of observing the children who didn't want to participate at first, who sat on the side, just wanted to watch. You know, some children took about a good 50 minutes to warm up to the activity. This is what process over product is. Next, let's do another one. So here, the little picture on the, on, on the left, um, it's a template, square template, and it says, draw the view. Okay, well... There's so much you can do and it's pretty hard. Even as an adult, you'd struggle to put all of that in such a small piece of paper. Versus put a piece of paper underneath your tables and do it with the children, by the way, okay? You actually put paper underneath with the children so they know they're not just scribbling under a table. There's a process and then go and color with them. It is such a fun activity to do. Draw your view. Again, process over product. Next. So we talked about loose parts. I'm gonna start speeding up because I know that I'm, I'm, I'm going to step over a little bit on time. Um, so this is a term you might be familiar with or not. 
If you're not, oh, I'm so jealous, you're going to discover something pretty awesome. So um, loose parts, what is it? They are materials that can be moved around a room, can be small or big, and there is endless possibilities. So open-ended clay. So why loose parts? Next. So loose parts are materials that can be moved around. I'm just repeating myself to make sure that you're aware. Around a room and use in endless ways. It can be small or big. The versatility of these materials provide children with virtually endless ways to create. They can get access to a variety of transient materials during play and exploration aids for the following. Going back to your curriculum. So concentration, problem solving, creativity, mathematical thinking, language, spatial awareness, fine and gross motor development, hand and eye coordination, social and emotional development. So here the picture on the right, um, it's big loose parts, yeah? Again, you don't see any adults participating. They're on the sidelines. Was that piece of wood heavy for one child to carry? Was there two children to carry? Ideally, it would have been older children who might have been in the playground before and maybe set it up the way they wanted to. And then the younger child is exploring that. Yeah. Then you have the pieces of wood underneath. There's containers on the side that you don't see. She didn't have to walk on the plank and do gross murder. She could have just gone in and start scooping up the um, it's um, wood, wood chips. It's open-ended. It's a kitchen. It's a drive-through. It's, you know, it's your living room. It could be a, it just becomes anything you want it to be. And that's what Loose Parts does for children. Next. So this is in our nursery school. So loose parts could be, so what do we have here? So we've got this little girl is playing with wooden napkin rings, which is the little oval things on the top, cork blocks. So that's the only thing that we bought that's actually made for children, by the way, okay? Rocks, find them anywhere. And then the long, um, I was gonna say the rope thing at the bottom is actually a dog chew toy that we found in a pet store. A lot of the products we have in our nursery does not come from toy shops. I haven't walked in a toy store in years, years and years and years. That is not where you find loose parts. And then we've got a plexiglass from Ikea on the bottom, which are very difficult to break. So again, there's just a different way of, of seeing things, which is really cool. Next. So this is outside again in our nursery school. So what do we have? We've got cardboard egg boxes, free guys. You don't need to buy them, okay? You need to replace them often, yes. But again, you're upcycling. There's a dog water bowl, which is the metal thing. Dog water bowls are great because they've got a really wide base. So they're super stable. Traditional palm mats that you find them in the souk. Dried lemons, that was from Global Village and they last forever. Be really mindful with food. I have to say food is a great way to teach, um, but again, that's another workshop on its own, um, but we need to be mindful with food. There's coconuts, again, they last for a really long time. Lovely texture. They've got weight to them, which is also really nice. Lazy Susan swivel board. So it's that wooden board in the middle, which moves around. And then we've got storytelling rocks. And what we've done is we've got rocks and we've actually glued um, different characters on them. So we've actually got children who are doing different things. Some of them were actually using them as loose parts. Others were actually telling a story, but there's so much going on on this table and nothing was bought in a toy store. Next, another example. So here we've got huge baskets, um, which is covered in that um, material, which is like a, um, like a leopard, but those baskets, children go in them, under them, pull them around the playgrounds. They're amazing get them from any um, um, furniture store. Then we've got uh, the balancing bowls that I was showing you before. So again, open-ended play. In this particular case, we were balancing these cardboard tubes that you can get down in Bo Dubai from the material shops. And the children were pushing either cars or um, little balls. Some of them got stuck, so that they actually had to figure out what fit, what didn't, and then they would land in the bowl and then there would be a balancing thing. So some children were able to hold the tube, others were there to throw it down, others were there to collect. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of children involved in this activity. 
very little was bought. Next. So this is not a picture from our nursery school. I took this online. Um, and I know that for a lot of people, this is quite, you know, there's a lot going on there. This is not something I would put in our nursery school. We can't really permit our children to get that far into messy play, which is a real shame. We do it differently though, with things that are easier. Flower is a bit of a pain, but I really wanted to shock, uh, have a shock effect in this to say that if you've got your children at home, why not? Really? Um, just find alternatives in nursery. Um, but this particular, the language that comes out of it, squish, splash, soft, smear, powdery, dry, wet, ooze, white. Those are really good vocabulary words. And that's what comes with open-ended play and sensory play. So as the adult, you can be inputting those words. You could be playing with it. That child is experiencing those words. And that's where messy play comes from. So again, I've taken it off the net. Making a mess is great because we know the benefits of messy play far outweigh the necessary cleanup, okay? Now, I can understand with the class of 10, you can't let all your children get all flowery, but you can do it with other products. For example, with soil. Soil, you just literally wipe it off. It's super easy. Do it, even if it's indoors, get those. You can get dog pools. Get all the messy play to happen in there and then just change the children. There are ways to get around it to make the cleaning process quicker with an environment where there are many children, okay? Remember, they can feel, smell, see, and sometimes even taste the consequences of their messy activity because they use their whole body, guys. You know that. Next. We're nearly at the end. So here I was just showing examples of messy play. So it's a lot more contained, but for example, here we've got the top uh, left end, we've got the doggy pool, which is the blue pool, and children are playing with heuristic toys. So heuristic play, for those who don't know, it's anything that is with items from your household. So everything in there are not toys. They're actually coffee pots, Arabic coffee pots, there's, you know, um, tins, and they're playing with colored rice. Again, coming back to food, this rice has been dipped in vinegar and with powdered paint, and it can last you years. It will not rot, it will not have um, mold unless you wet it, um, but if you air it out, it self cleans itself because of the vinegar, so there's no bacteria that grows on it, um, and weevils won't get into it either, okay? But then the child on the right, total freedom of how she wants to paint. There are no rules. She could have either done it with her hands, with a paintbrush, standing, why sit? They can stand also. Little ones actually find it easier when they're standing Okay, then at the bottom, this is a little bit more structured. Every child had their own paper. They're sitting, okay. They have, they were given ice cubes, but then they were let to explore how to use their ice cubes if they wanted to push it around with their hands, with a stick. And then on the right, we've got a water play there. Every child can decide how they want to touch the water. These are all messy play activities that are totally doable. This is what we do in our nursery school with many, many, many more. Next. So this picture, it, you can't see, I've actually got three pictures and it was showing you different ways of how the mud is used. So we've got one child who doesn't want to touch it. She's using a spoon. Um, the other child was very happy to put his hands in it and then put it through. Um, and then the last children, and it's not in the slide, you're actually children working together. Some are pouring water, some are putting the mud in. So every child, same element, are all using it differently and it's all messy play. Next. So these are, um, it, it is what it is. Things, so things little ones would love for us to know. When I show you something I have found, regardless of how small or simple, please respond with enthusiasm and interest because I've chosen to share my discovery with you. These are the moments your children remember, okay? Or if you discover something and call them over and see this tiny little ant walking somewhere, you know, this is, these are precious, precious, precious moments. If you ignore that, that child will not come back and see you. Next. So this is our last slide before we end off. So again, things that children would love for you to know. I don't need expensive toys to play with. What I need most is plenty of time to play. Can you please give that? You know, and, uh, and I'm gonna end it off on there. 
Um, so last slide, please. Thank you. Rafi, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Agat. It was a lovely presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us today. In regards to the questions that we're receiving about the certificates, as said in the beginning of the presentation, we just got the approvals to release the certificates on Wednesday and we are working on them. Hopefully that the first two batches would go out this week um, and we'll keep you updated if there's any change on that. Thank you for joining us. And again, thank you for your time. I'm welcome and I hope I've inspired you to go and explore. Have a great day. Thank you. Goodbye.